Many evangelical Christians believe extraterrestrials are demons. There's opposition in the US Congress to the passage of the UFO or UAP Disclosure Act. Congressman Matt Gates is a strong supporter of UFO disclosure. The second volume of US Army Insiders Missions has just been released. There's a new documentary on David Grush. US Space Command expands cooperation with international cooperations to create a Star Trek future, a new documentary on Elizabeth Clara's ET contacts. The Washington Post has a critical article on David Grush and Scientific American recommends that social scientists take the UFO topic seriously. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome to this week's edition of ExoPolitics Today, the week in review. Been an exciting week, Uh, lots of very interesting developments. So I want to start by going to my Twitter feed. And, and just like introduce you to what are the top stories that I thought were interesting from an exopolitical perspective. So this is a story that I found fascinating that appeared in the Daily Star, a British tabloid. And in that article, uh, in this Daily Star article, many evangelical Christians consider extraterrestrials to be demons. Now, that's not all evangelical Christians. So I don't want to condemn all all those people who take the take that particular approach to Christi to expressing their Christian beliefs. But there are many that believe extraterrestrials are demons. That uh, they have a very limited understanding of what these scriptures talk about. Whether we're talking the Old Testament, the New Testament. And the problem is that for those researchers that consider themselves evangelical Christians, many, several of them, or many of them actually focus exclusively on the data coming from researchers like Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, who have historically focused on alien abductions and reach the conclusion that extraterrestrials are involved in abductions, in this kind of like manipulation, extraction of genetic material, creating a hybrid uh, human alien race that will supplant Homo sapiens. Now, the problem with that is that it's it's limited. Uh, there, There is truth to that perspective that some extraterrestrials are indeed involved in these kind of abductions and creation of a hybrid species. But a majority of extraterrestrial races are not involved in that. In fact, they're very respectful and they operate in compliance with a kind of non-interference principle, which we consider to be a derivative of or the actual source of the non-interference principle as it appeared in Star Trek. So here you have uh, this uh, Daily Star article, Bible reading Pentagon commanders halted UFO research over fears aliens were demons. So there are a number of commanders in the Pentagon, people who have a a lot of authority in the Pentagon uh, that believe in the Bible that think that the UFO issue is actually introducing this topic of demons, and so they halt it. Uh, And so that's a real problem, because if we're going to have disclosure, if we're going to have, if we're going to have people taking the UFO topic seriously, it means that we we don't want to front load them with these belief systems that all extraterrestrials are demons. Uh, because that's going to prejudice them. And that's going to very much limit us in terms of how disclosure is going to be rolled out. And and at the moment, there is a problem 
because there are many Christian Christians in senior positions of authority in the military and elsewhere that believe that uh, extraterrestrials are demons. So, so this is an article, and here's a documentary filmmaker, Ron James, who discusses what he was told about some of these uh, Pentagon commanders who have this very jaundiced view of extraterrestrials as, as demons. So now I want to move on to the next uh, tweet. And, and again, for those that are, are new to the Week in Review, if you want to follow all of these stories that I am discussing uh, throughout the week or you want the references to pursue it even further, just go to uh, twitter.com forward slash Michael Sala and you will get there. Okay, so Elena Dinan did a webinar. Uh, oh, one week ago, so that would have been September. Oh, sorry, uh, that was October first. That's right, October first on Sunday, where she talked about some of the important characteristics about uh, the Galactic Federation of Worlds in terms of uh, joining where humanity needs to be. So definitely, I recommend that uh, Galactic Federation of Worlds uh, that is on Crowdcast, and you can go watch it. Uh, and the link is there on my Twitter feed. So definitely worth uh, taking a look at because uh, Elena Danan has had multiple contacts with benevolent extraterrestrials. Uh, she is one of the people that I think help bring a lot of clarity to the field so that we're not myopic focusing on the abduction research of people like David Jacobs and Bud, Bud Hopkins that we're, we're looking at the other side as well. And, and of course, you know, the classical contactees like George Adamski, Howard Menger, Orfeo Angelucci, those people, are, you know, um, they've long ago transitioned. So now we've got new generations of contactees and the latest generation, uh, we have people like Elena Danan, Jean-Charles Moyen, and uh, others, uh, old timers like Alex Collier, still, still in the field. So that's, um, that's the uh, webinar Elena Danan did on October 1st. So here's a interesting story uh, that comes from the Daily Wire. So the Daily Wire shows that there is um, uh, opposition in the Congress to the creation of a select committee on UFOs. So that would be a, a committee that would be focused exclusively on getting data, accurate data on the UFO phenomenon and releasing that to the general public. And there's also opposition to the uh, UAP Disclosure Act for 2023 being passed. Uh, so while there is opposition by a few members of Congress, the, the overwhelming majority of members of Congress, and this is by far a bipartisan issue, want to achieve both of those goals. They want disclosure and they want the US Congress to have a select committee. So you like you have a, a committee on intelligence. Um, so now you'll have a, 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 a select committee uh, dealing with the UFO topic. So that's something that's going to be very helpful in bringing about uh, transparency. Now, what I found very interesting is uh, Congressman Matt Gates, uh, the very same congressman who's, who torpedoed uh, the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy's tenure. Uh, this Representative Gates is also a very strong supporter of UAP disclosure. And I, th I think his star is rising in the US Congress just because of his power and because he has a lot of uh, initiative and people know they can't cross him uh, because uh, he, I mean, he uh, achieved a big scalp. Uh, Kevin McCarthy is gone because uh, he did not follow his commitments, according to Matt Gates. So I think when it comes to this UFO Disclosure Act, you know, people are not going to get away with talking the talk and walking a very different walk, I mean, which is very classical behavior. Uh, of, of of politicians that they talk a good story, 
but they never follow through. So you need people like Matt Gates, who's a strong believer or advocate of uh, UFO disclosure, to hold people uh, to their word, to get them to follow through on whatever commitments they've made to this issue. So that's uh, that's it's good to know who's opposed and who's in support of UFO disclosure in the US Congress. Okay, well, this week on October 2nd, Volume 2 of US Army Insider Missions was released, and that really describes uh, JP, who I'm working with, who is active with the US Army. I mean, he is unique. Uh, a lot of people find that hard to believe that someone that is active in the US Army is disclosing his participation in these covert missions off-planet or into underground civilizations, spaceports or underwater spaceports and space arcs and all of these things. Um, this is actually what's happening. This is real. Uh, he is active army. I mean, he's shown me the documents. He's, he's um, given me a tour of the base, the military base where he serves. So um, he is the real deal. And why he's allowed to do this, I, I discussed that in Volume 1 of U.S. Army Insider Missions, where agreements were reached between Nordic extraterrestrials, who he's been in contact with since 2008, and the U.S. Air Force Secret Space Program. So that's why he's allowed to do what he's doing. And at the moment, he's unique. I imagine in the future, there, there probably will be more doing what, he, what he's doing. But right now, he's unique in being allowed to speak about his uh, missions, covert missions uh, involving these reverse engineered spacecraft, secret space programs, and extraterrestrial visitors. So US Army Insider Missions 2 uh, discusses a lot of his uh, missions to underground civilizations, spaceports um, all over the world. So definitely uh, take a look at that. Right. Well, here's a, a documentary that has just come out. Um, this is titled Seven Days with the Man Who Confirmed Aliens Exist Under Oath. So this is uh, someone that accompanied David Grush during that very important uh, you, uh, congressional hearing on July 26th when David Grush appeared before the U.S. Congress, uh, the person who made this documentary was with David Grush for seven days, you know, both before and after that congressional hearing. And, and this is uh, the documentary that really details exactly what it was that was uh, that David Grush had said, you know, both on camera and off camera. Well, I mean, he's when we're talking about uh, while he was before the US Congress and you know away from that from that uh, scene so this is what was recorded into the documentary so here's a story uh, featuring uh, James Dickinson who is the current head of US Space Command he's a four-star general and he has pointed out that there are over 30 non-US based corporations around the world involved in space technology development agreements. And, and that's very important because what, what he's saying is that in, a, in addition to major US corporations involved in the aerospace industry, we're talking uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, uh, Boeing, you know, those are the, the biggest aerospace companies in the world that in addition to those US based aerospace corporations that are working with NASA, US Space Command, Space Force in building advanced aerospace vehicles for them, there are in fact another 30 non US based corporations also involved in technological development. And and this is very important because what it's what it's telling us is that yeah, this is another sign that you have two prongs to creating a Star Trek future. One prong is the civilian, which is the Artemis Accords, and presently there are 29 nations 
that have signed on to the Artemis Accords, which are all work or all bilateral agreements with the US at, as at the core, at the hub. Like you think of think of a wheel with uh, uh, spikes. Uh, the US is at the core, and then you have spikes to the twenty eight other nations making up the twenty nine. And then the the second aspect of this creating the Star Trek future is the Space Command. There is increasing cooperation between uh, the Space Commands or the Space Forces of different countries. So it's not just the United States, but it's also uh, France, Germany, Italy, Britain, United, uh, Australia. All of these countries and even Japan is also involved in collaborating at that highest military level when it comes to space because what's 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 being created here is the foundation for a multinational space fleet something like a space nato that will eventually become a something like a star fleet as described in the uh, star trek series so i think this this uh signing of, of these cooperations with 30 major aerospace corporations outside of the United States is just another sign that we are heading towards this Star Trek future. Okay, so here's an article by the Liber Liberation uh, Times that maps out competing interests concerning the uh, UAP Disclosure Act for uh, 2023. So what I found fascinating here is that it, a it identifies the role of major corporations such as Raytheon and the Aerospace Corporation in trying to undermine the act through assets such as General Mark Milley. So Mark Milley was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. On October 1st, he was replaced, and it's now uh, General uh, Charles Brown, Charles Q. Brown, who is the new... Um, head or the, the the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States. And this Times article describes how the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, actually played a big role in drafting the Disclosure Act to bring transparency to these classified reverse engineering projects. So that's very interesting. I mean, I, I was not aware of Jake Sullivan being a strong disclosure advocate. He is the national security advisor to uh, Joe Biden. Uh, and he, Jake Sullivan is also the head of an interagency UAP study group convened under the National Security uh, Council. So this is probably where he is playing this very positive role of champion, championing or supporting this uh, Disclosure Act. So that shows that this uh, UAP Disclosure Act that was passed uh, unanimously in the US Senate uh, as an amendment to the 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, that that also has strong support within the White House from no less than the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. Now, this is where it gets very interesting because one of these companies that was identified, uh, the Aerospace Corporation, that is against disclosure, that is against this UAP Disclosure Act, that is the same company that the inventor, Dave Rossi, identified as behind a surveillance and smear campaign against Elena Danan, who says that she is an emissary for the Galactic Federation of Worlds. So I thought that was very interesting that the, the, the same company that Dave Rossi identified as being behind this kind of surveillance and this kind of discrediting effort or smear campaign against Elena Danan to try and get people to not focus on her work, that that same company is also behind efforts to frustrate or pare back the UAP Disclosure Act for 2023. So, you know, there's a consistency there. So this is uh, the, the website that you can go and r read this article. It's uh, liberationtimes.com. Uh, 
And uh, there's the article that came out on October 2nd. The link is on my Twitter feed. It's written by Christopher Sharp, and it is uh, well worth reading just to get up to speed on who's for, who's against the UAP Disclosure Act, and of course, disclosure of the truth concerning extraterrestrial life. Okay, so again, my new book, um, it became a hot new release, number one, a hot new release. So, I mean, here it is. It is uh, definitely something I recommend people take a look at. I think it has a lot of excellent information there about JP and his missions. Okay, so in the book, uh, I talk about JP's um, missions to two underground spaceports. One in, one in the Alabama-Tennessee region, a very large spaceport, and another one under a South Atlantic island. This was a, a massive spaceport. And I thought that was very interesting given that there, is, uh, there was a remote viewing conducted back in 2005 where there were a number of very uh, skilled remote viewers uh, one of these include uh, Skip At Atwater, and they they actually did remote viewing of underground spaceports. So that was back in 2005, and they found an underground spaceport um, in Alaska. Another one, um, I think it was uh, Mount Zeal, uh, which is next to Pi uh, Pine Gap um, in Australia. And uh, two other locations, uh, um, uh, Alaska, and I, and we'll have it here. Where are the bases? Okay, Zimbabwe. Okay, okay, Zimbabwe was one location. The other is the Pyrenees Mountains in in France. Zimbabwe, Pyrenees Mountains in France, and I also mentioned uh, Alaska, Mount Hayes, and uh, Mount Zeal in. Australia. So apparently, according to the remote viewing done by some top remote viewers, Pat Bryce is a legend in the remote viewing community, and he identified four spaceports. And later generations of remote viewers, uh, Skip Atwater and others, have confirmed the existence of that. So that was done in two. I mean, two thousand and five. That article came out. So the mili U.S. military has been interested in these underground spaceports for for decades now, and so JP has just disclosed two more. So you can add to those four this underground spaceport in the uh, Alabama Tennessee area, and in this South Atlantic island, and these are spaceports that are extraterrestrial in origin. So we're not talking about uh, a space command or uh, space force. We're, we're talking about very large extraterrestrial spaceports in these different locations. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. So now we, we have information about six spaceports around the world. Okay, so now I want to go to, to this article in Scientific American, which is really very significant. It's time to hear from social scientists about UFOs. So this is Scientific American, which is the premier kind of science journal for scientists, academics, politicians, anyone that wants to keep up to date with uh, the development of science, they will go there. And so it's now saying, so here we are in this story, October 2nd, 2023. It is saying it's time to hear from social scientists about UFOs. And the subtitle is, whether or not UFOs exist, we need to pay attention to how they are influencing our politics and culture. Well, you know, that is, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's a very important uh, statement. A lot of academics have been very distrustful of the UAP issue, uh, of the UFO issue. I mean, we're talking 70 years of psychological warfare to dismiss the UFO issue from academia, from the scientific worldview. 
to dismiss it as tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. And now all of a sudden there's been a turnaround the last few years and now that the scientists, academics are being told you need to pay attention to this. And at the moment a lot of social scientists are saying, well, you know, this is still a lot of baloney, right? Uh, Scientific American is saying, no, no, it's not. You You need to pay attention to this. Even if you don't believe it, it's real. It still impacts politics and culture. So this is very interesting because 20 years ago, I made pretty much the same case. I was um, uh, I was uh, on the staff. I was uh, a researcher in residence at American University School of International Service in the Center for Global Peace, and I made the same argument. I said I we need to focus on this phenomenon because it has direct implications for world peace. And... I, for my efforts, I was uh, initially I was opposed, silenced. I wasn't sp- allowed to talk about it at the university, not associate the university with it, not have it on my university website. And eventually, I was dismissed, summarily dismissed. My program cancelled, and my appointment was not uh, renewed because I made this precise case. So, so it's taken twenty years for a prominent scientific journal like scientific american to say that it's okay for academics to study this and so this this is going to lead to a huge turnaround so what was impossible 20 years ago um, is now possible so that is a a very big development okay so here's um, some news about the galactic spiritual informers connection conference that's going to be from october 20 to 22 Uh, Most sessions will now be live streamed. So you can go to this link and you can find uh, information about the um, live streaming that's going to take place at this event. So uh, you can uh, just go to galacticspiritualinformersconnection.com and there you will find out what you need to do if you want to live stream this event. Now, of course, um, definitely if you can physically attend, that's that's the best because we get to meet you. But if you can't attend, I mean, people can't fly across the world uh, for a conference for, for, for many different reasons or maybe across country for various reasons. Uh, but now you can watch it online. And most sessions will be live streamed, not all of the sessions. So just go to the website and you'll find out which sessions are live streamed and which aren't. And I hope you can join us that way. Okay, so here's here's an article uh, by Sputnik or Sputnik. This article discusses Russia's conventional space forces. Now, Russia uh, has a very powerful military. I mean, they are... uh, they are probably the, well, in terms of nuclear weapons, the second most powerful nation on, on the planet in terms of nuclear weapons. And along with China, they are the, a major peer competitor to the United States. So uh, the uh, Russian space forces is growing in influence. It is having a lot more resources, a, a lot more equipment a lot more personnel uh, given to it for 24-7 round-the-clock mon- monitoring of, uh, non-made, of non-man-made space-based threats and hazards for, for Russia. Uh, it's uh, watching out for enemy strategic missile launches, um, also launching and operating about 120 military and dual-use spacecraft. That's very interesting. What kind of spacecraft do they have, uh, including communication? So this is where we get to pay attention to what Russia has developed behind the scenes in terms of a secret space program. Because Russia, along with China, understand where the future is is, uh, directing the growth of uh, military development. And that is that the new strategic high ground is space. So Russia and China are both deploying a lot of assets into space. So this article gives you an idea 
of, of how Russia has set up its space forces, which is a counterweight to the United States Space Force. It's a very interesting article in Sputnik. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, right, well, on on Thursday, uh, that was October 4th, I believe, uh, you had, uh, uh, we put out uh, one of the webinars I did back in 2020 on full disclosure versus limited hangouts. So that's available on YouTube. And so you can see how back then, three years ago, I was pretty accurate in terms of the limited hangout that would be rolled out, that as disclosure moves forward, as people start to learn about the truth of UAPs, they're, they're going to be given a very limited story, what's called the limited hangout. And, and that's because this is how they're going to hide the truth about secret space programs and extraterrestrial life. Um, certainly secret space programs, it looks like, and that's where we're heading at the moment, it looks like uh, with the UAP Disclosure Act of 2023, there's going to be some acknowledgement of extraterrestrial life in terms of non-human intelligence piloting these craft that have crashed. Uh, but then the efforts to reverse engineer these craft has, has, um, has been slow and hasn't succeeded. That's the limit. That's the limited hangout right there. So uh, I think that's, and that's for free. You can just go to my YouTube channel and you could watch it there. So the, the links again in my Twitter feed. Here's uh, an interview I did with uh, Eric Von Daniken uh, a couple of years ago, uh, who is uh, still very active in putting out a lot of information about the ancient astronaut theory. I mean, he's been working in this field since the 1960s. I think Chariots of the Gods came out kind of like 1967, 68, somewhere around that time. So he's been working in this field for over 50 years. He's still active, uh, very energetic, and very determined to find the truth of what's going on. So it was really a, a great honor to be interviewed by Eric in this um, it's a it's a one hour interview with Eric, and we we discuss secret space programs because he's an expert when it comes to ancient archaeology, the ancient astronaut theory thesis. But when it comes to modern secret space programs, you know he wants to know what's going on, and so that's what the interview was about. So uh, yes, if you want to kind of like um, reconnect uh with eric von daniken uh he is a living legend and uh, really i find uh, it was a great honor to be interviewed by him so yeah the link is on my twitter feed so you can watch that okay so timothy alberino uh, i've interviewed him a few times he's he's um authored a, a really uh powerful, very well-written book about um, UFOs and extraterrestrial life. And uh, he is very knowledgeable about the Peruvian Amazon region. He spent a decade there, and he has first-hand knowledge of some of the kind of like high strangeness in that part of the world. And, of course, this is due to what what happened around july june july of this year where you had those extraterrestrials supposedly attacking villages in that uh, peruvian amazon region and so there's been a lot of debate about that whether that was real whether it involved miners using jetpacks and so forth so timothy alberino he's going to he's actually going to do field work he's going to travel there and he's going to investigate whether or not that was real so he's taking a crew with him and he's going to take some uh, video of what's going on there so uh, uh, kudos to timothy alberino uh, he truly is uh, a really remarkable researcher being prepared to travel down to peru to investigate firsthand what's happening down there and i think it helps quite a lot that he's fluent in uh, spanish and in this kind of Amazonian dialect or version of Spanish that is spoken down there. Okay, so this is uh, very interesting. 
Uh, this is a documentary that has just come out. It is, uh, you can watch the trailer on YouTube. It has come out on Prime, Amazon Prime TV. It uh, was released on October 6th, Friday, October 6th. So that's a day ago from when you're watching this uh, transmission. So this is the trailer. It goes for a couple of minutes. I won't play it now. Uh, you can watch it on Amazon. It is well worth taking a look at because Elizabeth Clara's story is quite remarkable. She worked for South African military intelligence during the Second World War. And she later on was uh, had contact with an with extraterrestrials from the Proxima Centauri Centauri star system, and she fell in love with one of the extraterrestrials called Akon, and they had a, a love baby. Uh, this is quite extraordinary because once she reached the kind of term of of the baby, uh, she was taken off planet and gave birth to the baby off planet and the baby was then taken by the father and uh, she was released back because he she was told that uh, because this was uh, a hybrid involving uh, a human and alpha centurions that the baby and her would not be safe from the intelligence community uh, from like the Russian or the Soviet intelligence community that would be very interesting, interested in abducting the child or uh, eliminating the child because they might have thought that this child would have given the Anglo-Saxon Five Eyes world a kind of uh, head start in understanding some of these advanced technologies. So this is a fascinating story. She's the author of a book, Be uh, Beyond the Light Barrier, and uh, so now you have a documentary also titled Beyond the Light Barrier with Elizabeth Clara. Okay, so one more story. This is the Washington Post. And uh, the Washington Post, I still subscribe and listen to the Washington Post because along with the New York Times, it gives me an idea of where the intelligence community is, is, is uh, wants the U.S. public uh, to be directed, uh, kind of rule of thumb. Uh, the New York Times is associated with the U.S. State Department. It puts out a particular agenda that's in line with what the State Department wants to put out, whereas the Washington Post um, puts out an agenda which is more in alignment with the CIA. And it's no accident that Chief Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post and also works very closely with the CIA in in managing its um, its online libraries and uh, databases and so forth. So the Washington Post put out a story, an article on David Grush, and it discussed some recent documentaries. I, I mentioned that documentary um, earlier that was just released uh, one week with David Grush. So it discusses that particular documentary. And the the agenda is very interesting. The agenda or the narrative that it wants to put out is that, well, these are merely stories that are of interest to this kind of new generation of YouTubers who are attracted to a kind of glitzy, very novel narrative concerning uh, UFOs, but doesn't have any substance in terms of real science behind it. So it's a, it's a very cleverly framed article to kind of like lead the reader to think that uh, the, the UFOs information that is that is coming out through people like David Grush and others are just stories that has no real science behind it. Now, you know, the couple of problems here. Uh, Michael Schellenberger, who is an investigative reporter, uh, he's got his own... Uh, blog site, he, he calls it public, and he's put out several articles corroborating what David Grush has said, that yes, there are between 30 to 40 people with first-hand experience concerning non-human technologies that have been retrieved and are being studied and reverse engineered at various corporate and military facilities. So there you have corroboration 
for David Grush. So it's, David Grush isn't just putting out a story and a narrative, you know, based on what he was told through other sources. Here you have an investigative reporter who has spoken to dozens of witnesses. I mean, he says he's uh, up to 30 that he has spoken with personally that corroborate what David Grush has said. So the Washington Post article doesn't mention that at all because it doesn't want to give credence to this. And as I said, the Washington Post is putting out the CIA agenda and the CIA agenda is that all this information coming out about UAPs are just stories, nothing to take seriously here. There's no real science behind it. And sure enough, you have um, people uh, like uh, Professor Avi Loeb, head of the Galileo Project from Harvard University, um, he 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 is cited at the closing of this article. So you know, at the very end, the last thing people remember is Avi Loeb saying that well, uh, all of these things that David Grush has spoken about are just stories. There's no empirical evidence. There's no data, and scientists want data, and without that, it's it's just a bunch of stories. And and Avi Loeb says what, what I think is the kind of height of absurdity. He says, if we want to understand the UFO question, we need to get the data through telescopes. <laughs> yeah, you got it. That's right. If you want to understand what's happening with UAPs or UFOs visiting the Earth, you got to peer through a telescope, take recordings using telescopes wherever they are, and record this, these UAPs, and and then you have data, empirical data to be discussed. And so, but if you have eyewitnesses of a UFO landing, extraterrestrials coming out, um, welcoming you onto the ship, that's just another story, according to uh, Avi Loeb. And the Washington Post article uh, tends to kind of give. Uh, weight to that and steer people away from the David Grush story as, uh, as as just something that lacks any evidence. But as I said, Michael Schallenberger, an investigative reporter, has found eyewitnesses that support what David Grush has said. And we must never be fooled by scientists like Avi Loeb and uh, a, a sophistry by Washington Post reporters into thinking, well, when you have eyewitnesses talking about what they've seen, oh, that's just a story. That's anecdotal. That, uh, that is nonsense. This is eyewitness testimony admissible in a court of law and understood as evidence uh, around the world by any judicial system. Eyewitness testimony is considered evidence in a court of law. So you, th this is where we really need to kind of like make sure people like Avi Loeb, uh, the Washington Post don't get away with this kind of sophistry in, in trying to make us believe that all oh, these are just stories and we need empirical evidence. No, no, um, empirical evidence is just one part of the science sciences. And I mentioned earlier, uh, Scientific American saying social scientists should take the UFO issue seriously. Now that's because the social sciences look at what people experience, what they see and what they touch, what they handle, because this is a science. And that's something that those within the uh, astronomy community uh, tend to gloss over. They say, well, you know, we need to focus on the science. We need to focus on the empirical evidence. No, that's just one branch of science. You also have the social sciences that look at what people are experiencing, what they're reporting, and analyzing that and coming up with a um, analyses that are put out. That's a social science. It is, by definition, a science. So don't get fooled by people like Avi Loeb saying that we need to follow the science and we need to follow the hard data. That's only one branch of science. There's another branch. And I'm very happy that Scientific American is saying that social scientists need to take this issue seriously because you know, people who are having these experiences, uh, David Grush and many whistleblowers, uh, JP uh, and others like Elena Danan that are having first-hand uh, contact experience with extraterrestrials, these testimonies need to be taken seriously. So just to finish up, don't forget uh, my new book, uh, US Army Insider Missions 2, that's just come out. Just get that. Um, and I think that you will find it uh, very rewarding in terms of 
uh, the amount of information in there. Nearly 400 pages, so a, a lot of data to process. So thank you again for listening to Exopolitics Today, the week in review. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel, beat the YouTube algorithms, and I look forward to talking to you again next week. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Thank you.